Okay, making a deep impact, efficacy and safety of the GLP-1 receptor agonists. So evolving con concepts of managing type 2 diabetes, and I'll come to that in a few seconds. So you see, initially, although it's written here, sulfonuria, it was metformin, which started first, lost favor, then again was approved in 1994 for the management of type 2 diabetes. It is as late as that. But it has been in the market for such a long time. Self in India around 1954-1960. Now we saw in the last 15 years we have seen a rapid surge in the number of medications which have come up. Number of the drugs, more than 40 new type 2 diabetes um, uh, options, treatment options approved since 2005. And not only the drugs, I'm leaving aside the insulin. There are so many insulins which have come up insulin delivery systems which have come up, but this does not um, seem to have much impact in improving the glycemic control, which is a shame because in type 2 diabetes in India, we still have three quarters of the patients who are above the HbA1c of, of 7%. So that's a shame that in spite of coming up with multiple new drugs, better drugs, safer drugs, uh, with less hypoglycemic potential, but with preserved efficacy, we still have the sorry state of affairs where three quarters of our patients still have HbA1c of more than 7%. And um, the diabetes management remains a, a, a challenge because it is one of the major causes of death. Major, um, um, many of the patients present with microvascular complications. You know, many patients with type 2 diabetes may present with retinopathy or, uh, micro or albuminuria. And that's why it is recommended the retinopathy screening is started right at the onset. Whereas for type 1 diabetes, you can do it after four or five years. Uh, many of them present with macrovascular complications and more than a quarter um, have got diabetic kidney disease. So the CAPTCHA study uh, to, to understand the prevalence of CBD in type 2 diabetes found that about 33% of the patients with type 2 diabetes have established CBD uh, and 2 out of 10 are getting a glucose lowering uh, treatment with a proven cardiovascular uh, uh, benefit. So I think we know that atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease occurs more in type 2 diabetes, but yet one we are not optimizing the treatment for type 2 diabetes to patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease where they need, apart from the uh, blood sugar, they need something else for their heart. We are still not giving that. So the life expectancy is reduced by 12 years. So this is um, a cartoon showing that if you do not have diabetes, that's your life expectancy, which is cut by six years if you have diabetes and cut by 12 years if you have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And Indians, we are more prone to, to have this um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, see, when I had worked in England, I had I'd seen, it was such a surprising thing to see that in the foot clinic, majority of the patients were Caucasians, whereas the heart clinic, many of, um, of the Asians predominated or populated the heart, uh, uh, um, heart disease clinic. Because we seem to have more predilection to our heart. And hence, our approach to diabetes should be geared up to prevent the cardiovascular mortality. So our risk of heart disease is two to four times more. We have it earlier, 10 to 20 years earlier. And a third of diabetes have an increased risk of CBD. And majority of our patients are below the age of 50 years. So there are a lot of years left in them. So a lot of um, uh, uh, years for us to prevent the cardiovascular occurrence. Obesity is another problem. Two thirds of the patients are either overweight or obese, and it contributes to uh, more than one third of the overall diabetes and disability adjusted life years. So obesity remains a big problem. So it goes hand in hand with the diabetes. So we should be looking not only at the blood sugar levels, the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease prevention, but also the weight aspect. We know that small reduction of, uh, of, of uh, weight, you know, starting from zero to 5%, any single gram reduction of weight will help. 
just like any millimeter drop in blood pressure will help. So any one gram drop in weight will help. So if you have got at least zero to 5% weight loss, it will help in these two aspects. The higher your weight loss, you can see more number of comorbidities are taken care of. So um, more than 15%, you have got type 2 diabetes remission, which occurs mainly with the bariatric surgery. So the paradigm shift which is happening now is that we previously had a glucocentric management before 2008 was just blood sugar, blood sugar, blood sugar. Then it came that we should lower the blood sugar without causing weight gain, hypoglycemia and adverse effects. And now for the past few years, it is a vascular glucocentric. So it's not just the blood sugar, but prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or if there is existing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, preventing the recurrence of that. So the multiple pathophysiological effects, you can see here, impaired insulin secretion, hepatic production, decreased glucose uptake, appetite, increasing, which um, <coughs> Dr. Arvind Sosale had uh, talked in detail, all of these, the multiple pathophysiological effects. So the, the including based therapy, mainly the GLP-1 receptor agonist, addresses six out of eight of them. So advent of a GLP-1 receptor agonists, so we know the, the GLP-1 based therapy and the exentin skeleton based therapy, but it's, um, I think, probably easier if we tease it out as short acting and long acting. So the ones which are available is the lixazenatide, which is short-acting, intermediate-acting liraglutide, long-acting is dulaglutide, albiglutide, now which will come is semaglutide, which I think Dr. Jyoti Dev will be talking to us in the next presentation. So we see here the size is the lowest with the uh, liraglutide here, followed closely by the semaglutide, and here we see big slides, a uh, big size. So there is a, a, a saying that GLP-1 receptor agonists with large molecular size, because you can see the big difference, may not cross, do not cross the blood brain barrier and may not access satiety center, thus show less weight benefit. I don't necessarily agree with that, you see, because I feel that if that were the case, then all the larger ones would not have any weight loss at all. So that is not true. There are multiple other mechanisms by which weight loss is, uh, is, uh, is obtained. So if you look at the liraglutide, so this is the native human GLP-1 receptor agonists. So there's just two changes uh, in the fatty acids, uh, which makes it um, better suited for clinical use. as daily, once daily subcutaneous injection. Now, Coming down to the basics, the ones which we need is the HB1C reduction. We know if, if you compare liraglutide with all the other GLP-1 receptor agonists, barring dulaglutide, it has got more HB1C lowering ability. So here we see is exenatide is better. Here um, uh, we see it's exenatide long-acting. It is better in the harmony with albiglutide, numerically at least better and with the lixazenatide, clearly much better with the dulaglutide. It's only with the dulaglutide, uh, there is numerically dulaglutide seemed to fare slightly better than the liraglutide, but this was statistically not significant. However, the, the, the all score, 10 out of 10 score was with the weight reduction. So here you can see that it beats all the others as far as weight reduction is concerned. Mind you, I've not shown you about semaglutide here because I've saved it for Dr. Jyoti Dev. So here, uh, with the exenatide, with the exenatide long-acting, albuglutide, dulaglutide here, although the efficacy was numerically better, but weight difference much better uh, with the um, uh, uh, liraglutide. So exenatide everywhere, the weight is 10 out of 10 better than all the other existing GLP-1 receptor agonists. Now, this is an interesting study, uh, Lira Prime study, a global trial uh, with about 10% of patients being in India, from India. So the inclusion trial was, uh, this was done in several countries. I think, yes, it was nine countries. 
and close to 2,000 patients. Diabetes for more than three months, HbA1c 7 to 9 on metformin. Now you divide into two groups. You start liraglutide up titrating from 0.6 to 1.8, or at the discretion of the investigator, you add other agents like alpha glucosidase inhibitors, DPP4, SGLT2 inhibitors, sulfonuria, or thiazolidinediol. So that's uh, so direct comparison head to head of liraglutide with all the other oral hypoglycemic agents. And this was done for a period of two years. So we can see here that almost half of the patients had SGLT2 inhibitor and about 40% had DPP4 inhibitors. And surprisingly, only 10% had sulfonuria. And the primary uh, 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 outcome was to measure failure um, to get to um, HbA1c of more than 7%. And with the liraglutide, it took 107 weeks, but with the others, it took around 65 weeks. So clearly, liraglutide seems to keep holding on um, uh, to, to, to lowering the blood sugar levels better than the other agents. Now, if you look at the HbA1c target less than 6.5%, so double the number of patients um, uh, achieved HbA1c less than 6.5% with liraglutide, less than 7% without weight gain, again, much ahead, um, less than 7% without hypoglycemia. That's a very significant practical uh, uh, indicator. And you can see here, again, is more than 60%. And if you con consider everything without hypoglycemia and body weight gain, again, it is clearly much, much better than the other oral hypoglycemic agents. So I put, I added this slide, the great study, uh, which I know, you know, has been uh, just been um, um, discussed in this, this year's ADA, where they divided the patients on metformin into four arms. One was citagliptin, one was liraglutide, one was glargine, and the other was glimepiride. And they followed them up for five years. And the meantime to primary metabolic outcome, that is, when do these drugs fail to, to an, an HbA1c crosses seven? So you can see here, the is, uh, citagliptin very early crosses seven. So less than 700 days when it crosses um, HbA1c of more than seven. So the earliest to fail, the PP4 inhibitor, then we have the emeparide sulfonuria, then we have insulin in the form of glargine, but the drug to, to, to not to fail, or taking the longest to fail is liraglutide. Clearly, you can see it's towering above the others. So the anti-inflammatory, anti-atherosclerotic disease modifying uh, ability. So it has got multiple data, animal data, and human data to suggest the anti-anti-anti-inflammatory and anti-atherosclerotic effect. We have got the leader trial, which is a very big, well-conducted trial. You've got 13% reduction in the three-point mace with CB death reduction of 22%. These were statistically significant. Non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke was not statistically significant. So uh, in here, um, uh, there was significant weight loss and less severe uh, reduction in severe hypoglycemia and reduced hospitalization due to heart failure. So again, going to great study, uh, any CVD, meaning three-point maze, heart failure, angina, TI, revascularization. Again, you see that liraglutide is the lowest which causes the, any CVD outcome as opposed to DPP-4, uh, sulfonylurea, or, or even insulin. And if you just look at the three-point maze, again, it is the lowest at 2.8%. Now you compare that with insulin, it is 4.2%. So, so we have got multiple data now CVOT data, head-to-head -head data, and this grade uh, about a five-year um, long-term data to suggest the cardiovascular protecting ability of liraglutide. So if you look at the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors combined, the CVOTs, uh, in here you would see the GLP-1 receptor agonists. This is the line, which is one. So we can see here leader clearly on this side, sustained six, 
uh, Pioneer 6 crossing the midline, but the number of patients were less. Hence, you have got a longer line, leader, shorter line because of larger number of patients. So overall, the hazard ratio comes down to uh, 88. So it is 12% uh, reduction. And in the SGLT2 inhibitor as well, it is about 10%. So roughly similar sort of um, um, uh, three-point mace reduction. It is. It is. Um, it will not be fair to compare uh, the GLP-1 with the SGLT-2 because the study populations are clearly different from each of the CVOTs. But we can see the trend of what is happening here. So I think the evolving recommendations from the August bodies have now changed uh, with the ADA ESG saying that, yes, first line is metformin, but if you have indicators of high risk or established atherosclerotic CKD or heart failure, then consider independently of baseline HB1C. So HB1C goes out of the window here. That independently, if it is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, preferably GLP-1 receptor agonist. If it is heart failure or CKD, preferably as GLP-2 inhibitor. But for both, you switch if one doesn't uh, apply, i.e. if there are any contraindications or any intolerability. <clears throat> now, for the European Cardi um, Society of Cardiology, again, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease of very high CV risk, it's either GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitor. They have gone one step further of adding metformin after starting these medications. So for the ACE, you can see ACE guideline GLP-1 receptor agonist is right at the top, even ahead of the SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, uh, in ADA, it is not just about HB on C, not just for ADA, for all of them. It's about established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If you have that, what is established cardiovascular disease? If you have had got an MI or a stroke or peripheral vascular disease, and indicators of risk that is more than 55 years with any cardiac, carotid or lower extremity stenosis of more than 50% or LVH, that makes you high cardiovascular risk, then you're looking at GLP-1 receptor agonist first and then SGLT-2 second. If you have CKD and, alb and or albuminuria, CKD and albuminuria, then you're looking at SGLT-2 inhibitors first. If you're looking at GLP, uh, looking at HB1C drop, clearly the GLP-1 receptor agonists are very efficacious next to insulin efficacy-wise in getting the blood sugars down, and hence the ADA guideline has put GLP-1 receptor agonist ahead of insulin because GLP-1 receptor agonist gets the HB1C down robustly without increasing the hypoglycemia, but also with the added advantage of cardiovascular protection and weight loss. So I think in summary, and I think I have finished on time. Yes, I've got one minute left. We know that the prevalence of CVD is very high and more so in our this Indian patients. In an Indian setting, GLP-1 receptor therapy can be placed earlier in the therapy of type 2 if you want to gain the benefit. You can see with the SGLT2, the benefit starts early. With GLP-1, it starts later, presumably because the effect on the blood vessels are there with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, whereas with the SGLT2 it is directly on the heart. So liraglutide is the only one with significant reduction in all three-point maze, CVD, and all-cause mortality. So with that, I end and hand it over to the organizers.